This is a production of China Central Television America. Culture. It's a word that holds different meanings for different people. But there are some shared human experiences that bridge cultural boundaries. And the gatekeepers to those experiences are cultural ambassadors entrusted with bringing the world closer together, one note or one skyhook at a time. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. <laughs> He is a living legend, an icon of American jazz music. He began his career as an 11-year-old child prodigy, performing piano concertos with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. In the six decades since, he's come to be recognized as one of the pioneers of modern jazz music, collaborating with musical giants and mentoring the next generation of jazz greats. And as full-frame contributor Sandra Hughes found out, through the years, Herbie Hancock has also been one of America's most influential cultural ambassadors to the world. Herbie Hancock says the spirit of jazz is the spirit of openness. And for five decades, music lovers have heard his message. Through jazz, barriers are broken. The music reminds us on a daily basis just how much we all have in common. Growing up in Chicago, he played classical piano. By his teens, he had tuned into jazz, still tickling the ivories, but to an entirely different rhythm. Hancock's early career put him on stage and in the recording studio with jazz greats like trumpeter Miles Davis and saxophonist John Coltrane. Their music has a, almost a philosophical message in it as well that would include things like uh, sort of expressing your personal creativity, not being afraid to go into areas that aren't your comfort zone. Kind of delving into the unknown. Hancock has made more than 100 albums, won 14 Grammys, and has his prints firmly planted in jazz history. In 2011, UNESCO named him Goodwill Ambassador to promote intercultural dialogue. Saxophonist Wayne Shorter and Hancock struck a chord as musical colleagues. At a certain point when you're playing whatever music you're playing, it can be jazz or whatever, at some point some musicians will, will become statesmen. And Herbie to me always like going into as a statesman. A statesman who has played a note in every musical milestone since the 60s. He's famous for songs like Watermelon Man from his first album. And of course, his fusion of jazz and funk on Rocket. While Hancock has hit the high note playing jazz ambassador to the world, here in the United States, he's focused on educating the next generation of jazz musicians. Hancock is chairman of the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz. The mission statement of the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz is to preserve and promote jazz. And uh, there are many, many programs that we do. We do programs on the high school level, we do programs on college level, we have an international competition. Hancock helps teach graduate students on scholarships from the Thelonious Monk Institute at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. The idea is for living legends to pass on their musical talents. Diego Urbano is a vibes player from South America. To get this scholarship to come up here and get your masters in jazz music, I mean, what does that mean to you as an artist? Well, it's basically a dream come true. It doesn't get any better than this. So it's the, the biggest opportunity I think I'll ever have. This year's students are rehearsing for their final performance. I feel like 
Every teacher that's come in to work with us has given us sort of a different concept of music or a different direction to explore. So I kind of feel like I have information that I'm going to be exploring the rest of my life. It's really exciting. It's never something that you get used to. Um, when you have people like Wayne Shorter and Herbie who you consider like people you really looked up to since the very beginning, it's definitely inspiring and an up uplifting experience also. This is the graduating class of 2014. Herbie Hancock attended their final recital. The band played original works. The proud teacher and mentor took notes and was clearly as pleased as the audience with the students' musical growth. And for the students' devotion to the genre of jazz, Hancock says it best. Jazz makes a profound difference in all of our lives. A message that Hancock has spread to the world through music that is uniquely American but has connected continents and promoted unity everywhere it's been played. For Full Frame, this is Sandra Hughes in Los Angeles. Joining me now is jazz musician and chairman of the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, Herbie Hancock. Herbie, thanks so much for coming in and joining us here on Full Frame. Yeah, thank you so much. So let me start with this simple question. Uh, what is it about jazz? Because I love this quote from you. It's, there's no judgment in jazz. You could perform anything. We started off by talking about how you did classical music. What was it about this form of music that really turned you on? Well, let, let me explain that phrase, you know, which says, there's no judgment in jazz. If you're playing with a group and you start thinking, I don't like what the, what the bass player played or I don't like what the guitar player played, the music just stops. <laughs> the music can't stop. If you're playing a concert, it has to go on. So the, the only way to make it work and the purpose of actually being there is to create something, give something to the audience, give something, something of, of uh, truth, something that you really feel, something that uh, you'll stand behind, something that... Um, is your feeling for the moment. And whatever happens, the object is uh, how can I turn this into something of value? That's what it's about. Describe for our viewers, because most of us will never have that opportunity to perform in front of a crowd. What's it like to bypass the ears, go straight to the soul or the heart of the audience? And you must yeah. feed off that too. Oh yeah, it's, it's a great energy. Uh, um, it, it requires focus. Um, but I've been doing it for so many years, um, my motivation and my trust um, and my determination, that was really the word I was looking for, this determination is, is so much stronger now when I perform than, than years ago. I guess that comes from experience. <laughs> It's so rewarding from the inside that uh, um, uh, there's, there's nothing else, there's nothing else quite, quite like it. You know? I want to talk to Ambassador Hancock, but I want to ask one more uh, question about music and performing. Mm -hmm. What's it like as a young guy just starting out and just happenstance, you, you flip on the radio and there's your music. What's that like? What's that experience like? Um, it, it, it really, of course, warms your heart. I mean, you think, wow, my music playing on the radio after years of hearing a lot of other people that you don't know, finally you're hearing your own music on the radio, I mean, when I was young, it was, it was the radio. It wasn't. We didn't have iPhones and <laughs> you know uh, uh, the technology that we have today. But um, uh, it was. It's of course great. It's a great yeah. experience. 
Imagine if yeah. you're in your car. Everybody, shut up. I want to listen. Turn it up loud, I guess. It's still, <laughs> still kind of nice. If I'm alone, if, if, if I'm in my car and I'm alone and, and I happen to turn on the, uh, you know, the radio and, and something of mine comes on, you know, it makes me smile. I'm, I'm happy that, <laughs> that I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, that they thought enough of my music to play it. Uh, so you get this goodwill ambassadorship, mm -hmm. and one of your first things that you're talking about is International Jazz Day. So take me back in time to that. What was it like uh, getting this post and then coming up with this idea? Well, um, this was maybe 12 years ago that I was, uh, that the, the Lonely Monk Institute was asked to make a presentation for the end of what was called Philosopher's Day, an event that they had every year at UNESCO in Paris. And uh, the person that kind of was responsible for putting it together, uh, uh, Mika Shino is her name. And anyway, he, we put together from the Thelonious Monk Institute uh, a program for the end of that day. It was so successful. Uh, and in, in the process, I got to know Mika and uh, one day we were brainstorming just about life, about, uh, about conflict, global conflict, uh, the conflict just in general, um, uh, and, and various subjects having to do with the issues of the day. And she liked the way I was expressing myself. She liked my viewpoint. And uh, she said, what would you think about the idea of being a good, goodwill ambassador? And um, I was thrilled that she felt that I, that I was suitable for that. Right. And the first proposal that I made as goodwill ambassador uh, was... International Jazz Day to establish one day, you know, which is April 30th, uh, every year as International Jazz Day. And it's a partnership now between UNESCO, the UN, and the Thelonious Monk Institute. You know, the Institute actually puts the whole thing together. Um, you know, but it truly is a, a global event reaching billions of people. And, and, and I'm happy to announce that, that this year we will have participation from every country on the planet. kernel of an idea and hope that it would blossom into something special. I guess it's the same as when you sit down with the guys and, hey, I think I've got this great idea, we can make this song, mm -hmm. except this is much larger in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. What's it like to have that kernel of an idea and then look, you know, to take it a few years later and say, wow, this is unbelievable? <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually turned out to be much bigger than we ever could have imagined. Uh, it, it reaches a billion people now. Jeez. What was also impressive to me was that when I made the proposal at UNESCO, um, it was immediately accepted within two or three days by the, the ambassadors from all of the nations in UNESCO. That's 193 nations. Uh, so it just shows that the appreciation of, of jazz and respect for jazz is huge, it's global, and has been embraced by the world. So what makes it universal, you think? What is it about it that, uh, that's able to stitch together all these different continents, peoples? I think the main characteristic is a sense of freedom. It really is uh, liberating. Uh, as a performer, it's being uh, uh, in the moment. Um, 
and we mentioned non-judgmental. Um, it's also about teamwork. I mean, there are a lot of amazing characteristics that are great, not just for music, but also great for living. Um, it shows a, an amazing respect for each other, for the mu each of the musicians, really, truly respect and trust each other. It's also about um, uh, courage, not being afraid to explore the unknown. So the, a lot of really great things. And, and the idea of to take whatever happens and to try to turn it into to a flower, and to, to try to embrace it and find something or create something within whatever happens musically, you know, find a way to make it into something that works, that, that fits. I mean, everybody could use that in their daily life. You know? <laughs> well, uh, three words jumped out right there from what you were saying. Great for living. How so? Well, because, I mean, all those characteristics are characteristics that we really need to exhibit in, in daily life. You know, it's important to be in the moment. It's important to be non-judgmental. Yes, there's a time for being judgmental. We have to make decisions about things. But, but uh, um, the, one of the most important things is respecting our fellow man. We're all the same people. We all come from the same root. And for us to be fighting each other over nonsense makes no sense. At the same time, um, being, having the, the courage to uh, think outside the box is very important. I mean, that's where the creativity lies, is not just taking what you know and trying to do something with it, but even being, not a, being unafraid to explore what you don't know and be, being able to, again, be in the moment and improvise. Uh -huh, uh -huh. All that stuff is, is, is great for daily, daily life. You're saying nonsense, no sense. I mean, who could disagree with that? It's interesting. It seems like uh, the world focuses on the conflict and maybe not as much on culture. And culture can bridge that divide in many respects, can it? I mean, it's interesting. I interviewed mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Carter not too long ago. And one of the things that he talks about with great pride is the fact that this exchange between China and the United States wasn't just, you know, it's not all just economics. It's that so many students came from China and got a taste of the United States, and so many people from the United States went and got a taste of China. And that yeah. is, the, that bridge is really important, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, culture can really lead the, the idea of bringing people together uh, and, and cutting through the barriers that separate people. Because when you separate people, you also separate ideas. Ideas aren't always created by one person. Sometimes ideas are created by collaboration. I mean, that's what's so important. I have an experience I, I can uh, tell you about uh, that happened at the Summit of the Americas when President Clinton was in office. Uh, he actually took a jazz group down from the Thelonious Monk Institute, a student group that we had with a couple of uh, of uh, guest artists, I was a, a, actually a guest uh, working with the students, and and um, for all the the countries in North and South America, of course, we were there in Santiago, Chile, and at one of the events was for each country to have a cultural presentation. So some of the countries had <laughs> huge orchestras with costumes. I don't know, maybe they had acrobats and <laughs> clowns. I don't know, but huge production, right? We had a small, you know, sextet, I think. And we didn't have any special costumes. Um, and we just went up there and played. And I could feel, it was tangible, that whatever jealousies and, and egos that w had been in the room by, oh, wait till you see our country's presentation, and that kind of s spirit, you know. I was, I was feeling that in the room before. When we started to play, it cut through all of that. I could f feel people feeling just comfortable with each other 
the ambassadors feeling comfortable with each other, you know, and, and it was the music, it was jazz that was, that was doing that. Wow. And the next day, President Clinton had a, a, a small thank you event. He walked right up to me and he said, thank you so much. He said, he said, what you guys did, did more for international relations than any diplomats could have done, than any ambassadors could have done. That's amazing. I, I, I want to talk to you about teaching, but I, but I also want to talk to you about something that um, usually when you go up on stage, everybody's listening to you. And what I thought was interesting, you've, gone, you've traveled, you've been to Russia, you've been to China, and I know you've said, I'm going to go and I'm going to listen. So you're kind of on the receiving end. What have you learned uh, by listening? Uh, what are some of the things that you've come back with? You know, you actually mentioned one of the most important characteristics of jazz, too, which is listening. So it's very important to me to be able to listen. It's, it goes beyond listening. It's absorbed. You know. Yes, the ears are involved, but also the eyes are involved. You know, the senses are involved. Uh, uh, to absorb something from the culture. And uh, in doing that, it, it gives you some sense, some feeling for the people. It, it, it brings you closer to them. I mean, you feel closer when you actually listen to the, to the music of another culture. You, you become a world citizen in a way. I know that yeah. teaching's uh, big for you, and, and you've worked with so many greats, and I'm sure you've, you've learned so much from them, and I'm sure it's a, it's a big part of, of passing the baton. How important is that for you? Oh, it's of the utmost importance, especially today. I'm, I'm 74 years old now, and so the idea... You look 44, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I think you need my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> um, our young people are our future. And I know that even when, when I was young, when I was first learning about jazz, there were so many musicians that helped me that brought their experience and shared their experiences with me, you know, gave me guidance, uh, encouraged me. And so, especially at this point in, in my life, I want to do the same thing. It's, it's my turn to, to follow that, that uh, tradition. And, um, and it's wor it worked for me, so I'm, I'm sure it will work for them. As we look back on your past, that 11-year-old kid uh, doing those concertos, here you are, 74. Uh, talk to me about that arc. Uh, could you have ever imagined uh, what your life's been like, not just on the stage, but just all of these experiences that you've been able to have? Uh, and music's actually given you that, that venue to do that. I've, I've had a great life. <laughs> I've had a, a great life. I mean, it doesn't mean that, that I was born with a silver spoon in my, my, my mouth. Uh, everything hasn't been roses, but fortunately I've been able to uh, overcome and defeat um, uh, any of the obstacles in my life that w where I could have been the victim, somehow I've been able to survive and, and, uh, and overcome and learn. You know, there's value to having obstacles. Or else, how would we grow if we didn't have obstacles? That's how we learn, you know? When you're a kid and you, in, you, you learn to ride a bicycle, right? What happens? You don't just start and you just go off into the sunset. <laughs> you fall. You scrape your knee, you know, but eventually you learn. So um, th this process is... is important, you know, and uh, so in my, my life, even with the ups and downs, I've always uh, been a positive person, uh, and I've always been a curious person, and, and, and I've learned the importance of being open-minded, and, and as a result, I've been able to get uh, 
great uh, uh, opportunities from life, and hopefully I've uh, been able to take those opportunities and and turn them into uh, something of value. I mean, that's what that's my goal. The obstacles, in a sense, give you the wisdom, which probably also guides the direction of your music in a way, and probably influences the type of music you produce in a way. Yeah, but, you know, everything is not roses. <laughs> so. Um, uh, it's um, important to be able to recognize, uh, take responsibility for your mistakes, but not be burdened by guilt, uh, to be able to accept what has happened, but always work on improving, always work on, on growing, always having a sense of never giving up and the fight against your enemy and your enemy is yourself. It's your own, in Buddhism we say fundamental darkness. It's the part of yourself that's always telling you, hey, they're not looking, why don't you go steal that or, you know, it's the one that's giving you these bad ideas, you know. So fighting against that part of yourself and everybody has that, it's your evil twin. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, uh, music has been a way to uh, f help me to focus on being creative. And because jazz has such great characteristics, and, and through that and my practice of Buddhism, you know, putting all of those things together has really helped me to, to make some really good choices in my life. Well, I heard you say, you quoted Miles Davis one time as saying, don't ever finish nothing. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to finish this, and I wish we didn't, but it was great fun chatting with you. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you very much. Coming up, there is no doubt, as Herbie just demonstrated, that music is an invaluable tool linking cultures. But sports can unite people across cultures as well, and we'll be joined by a sports icon turned cultural ambassador in just a moment. Plain and simple, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is one of the greatest basketball players in the history of the National Basketball Association. His former teammates and rivals have called him the greatest basketball player of all time. Kareem, swing left, right hand, 12-footer, good! The pictures tell the word. They love their captain. They love their leader. He holds the NBA's scoring record with an awe-inspiring 38,387 career points, but his second act in life has been just as inspiring. Since retiring in 1989 after 20 seasons in the league, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has become an outspoken advocate for education, working to highlight the importance of STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. And in 2012, then Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton appointed him as an American cultural ambassador. Here to discuss the role of sports plays in bridging cultural gaps and his role as a cultural ambassador is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and we want to welcome you to Full Friend. Great to have you on the broadcast. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, our viewers probably don't know this, but uh, in, early in my career, I was like a cub reporter for an L.A. radio station and had to go and cover the Lakers. And after a while, it kind of felt like Groundhog's Day. You know, it's like I ask the same questions every day, get kind of the same responses. And I remember uh, there was only one variant. Sometimes I'd come up to you and say, Kareem, do you want to talk? And you were nice about it, but kind of from not tonight. And I started to think, you know, either this guy's an introvert or perhaps he kind of feels like it's Groundhog Day having to do this over and over again. Or third, he was repulsed by me. So I want to know what's the answer. <laughs> Sir, I have no need to be repulsed by you. You're a perfectly nice guy. Um, it's what you talk about Groundhog Day. Uh, we so focused on our careers, and um, dealing with the press is like very low on our list of priorities. So you know we, we want to get it over with, yeah. and it's just uh, more or less the whole idea of uh, don't let anything distract you from what you're really here to do. And sometimes we we get too much into that and don't realize that uh, this is how we relate to our fans and the people who care about what we do. Uh, this is sometimes their only way to access us. And, you know, if you don't understand that, you, you can make some mistakes. But, you know, the funny thing is it's like I started to think after talking, trying to talk to you on a couple of occasions that, you know, 
it's a weird profession that you were in. I mean, like a guy who's a plumber doesn't have to come home and when he's getting ready to go in the shower, people ask him, why did you use that pipe wrench on that pipe? You know, but with right. you, it's every night having it thrown back out. Maybe you shouldn't have done this or that. It does have to be kind of uh, either a distraction or kind of an annoyance in a way. It, it, it can be annoying, but um, if you prepare for it, it it's, it's not as bad as it is if you um, are annoyed and unprepared. You're going to have a really bad time. But so many athletes have a difficult time transitioning after they retire. Yeah. So, like, there's this void. You know, what am I going to do with my life? As a cultural ambassador, I mean, how much of a challenge is it? What was the feeling like uh, when Secretary Clinton made you a cultural ambassador? And how much do you enjoy it? Well, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was interesting because you go someplace. I, I went to Brazil. And uh, people wanted to know what life in America is all about. They, they want to know from somebody that uh, they feel has some credibility. Um, they don't want to be the, uh, the focus of propaganda. They want to know what, what's, what's the skinny on it. You know, how does the United States work? What's it all about? And uh, in Brazil, it was particularly interesting that they're trying to make Brazil a more inclusive society. They have a history of slavery and then uh, a history of uh, people of color not doing very well only Europeans doing well. They want to change that. They want to integrate the society. And the best way to do that is through education. So the United States is working with the Brazilian government to improve their educational foundation so that everybody has access to uh, the knowledge that they need to, for Brazil to become a first world country. That's, that's what they want to do. So the fact that um, a black American could, through the democratic process, become President of the United States, they they were very interested in that because um, they didn't think that could ever happen. Yeah. So uh, the United States, by example, is uh, showing the people of Brazil um, that democracy can work um, if you, if you actually support it and uh, you know it's transparent and. Uh, respects and tries to fulfill the, the needs of the people. What about basketball as a bridge? Because I'm just thinking about the playoffs as they're going on. You got Dirk Nowitzki, who's from Germany. You got Nene from Brazil. You know, you just mentioned Brazil, uh, Martin Gortat from Poland. It seems like the NBA has changed since you got out of the league. It's it's a universal league now in many respects. Oh yeah. Well, it, you know, actually, it started my, my last year in the '80s. Uh, it actually had started then. There were uh, a couple of guys that were from Europe. Uh, Kim Olajuwon from Nigeria, mm -hmm. and that that trend just grew because uh, the game has become so popular. But um, it, it's uh, it's an international game. I never thought it would catch up to soccer in terms of being popular worldwide, and uh, that's happening. It's a pretty amazing thing. And you look at China. Yao Ming made such a huge difference in terms of you know th this explosion of interest in the NBA there as well. Exactly. The, the popular popular popularity of the game has like really just gone haywire in, in China and uh, they all know all about the NBA the stats everything it's a pretty amazing thing what about basketball what does it teach I mean what are some of the messages you could take overseas about what you learn from the game and how it can change a person well uh, teamwork it's, it's essential you can't be good at it unless you, you understand te teamwork conflict resolution uh, you have to learn about preparation, uh, understanding your game plan, and uh, being able to react to the decisions that uh, everybody else on your team makes in time. You have to do that in a basketball game. It really uh, brings people together that way. It's, it's not about the individuals. It's uh, what five people can do together. So I, I think um, for so many people <clears throat> who get those values from the game, um, th it benefits them uh, their whole lifetime. And it keeps you in shape too. You know? <laughs> that's a tough. That's yeah. a definite uh, bonus. And look at you; you're in terrific shape still. The other thing is adversity too. I guess there's one thing that you'll you can be assured of in life, which is there there are going to be adverse situations. And right. and uh, I think the game kind of teaches you how to overcome adversity in many respects. Right? Well, to to just keep uh, plugging at it till till the final uh, till the final bell. You know, when when the horn rings at the end of the game, you got to accept it. You know, you got to move on. Yeah. And that's that's a very good lesson for people to learn also. Let me throw out a quote, and I'm sure you're probably going to recognize it right off the bat. You can't live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you. John Wooden. Uh, and John Wooden always had these great aphorisms. But in many respects, I think when you're going overseas as a cultural ambassador representing the United States of America, 
That sort of encapsulates what he's talking about in many respects. Oh, exactly, because um, the whole idea of, of teamwork, he, there are guys that can do certain things and guys that can't do certain things. So you've got to understand that. Um, you have to understand your own uh, weaknesses and get help at times and be humble enough to accept that. Um, it, it really uh, develops a lot, a lot of good character issues. For, for people. We talked about uh, being a cultural ambassador, but uh, you, you know, what I think is really interesting about you, and, I, and you could tell even when I was covering you, um, you're a really cerebral guy. It's, it, you're not kind of the, the norm for a lot of basketball players or football players where you're just solely focused on sports, or maybe perhaps that's a blanket statement that's not fair as well. But, but the thing is, uh, you've written books, uh, you, you've been involved in documentaries. Um, did you find that you just like had an open canvas and somebody handed you a paintbrush and now I can create my own kind of other career outside of sports afterwards? Uh, I think that that certainly is, is part of it. And um, throughout my lifetime, I, there's been things I've always been interested in and wanted to try my hand at. And uh, by doing what I've done, I, I've gotten those opportunities. You know, so I've got a chance to make a documentary movie. It was very difficult, but um, you know, living in, in Los Angeles, everybody thinks that they can be a filmmaker, right? <laughs> and, uh, we, we They're learned, right, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> no. Very few of them are right. And, but you gotta, you got to go through this process to find out. But it, it, it's fun and it's a challenge, and um, it, it, it's been wonderful just having those opportunities. Well, you bring up the documentary. Let's watch a, a, a quick clip, and then I want to get your thoughts afterwards. So let's take a look. Do these young guys think they make $20 million a year because they can play? They were just born at the right time. Basketball the NBA, when it started, was segregated. We really had nothing. It was time to redefine who we are in the art, in music, in sports. All the older guys, we couldn't thank them, you know, uh, enough for what they did. On the shoulders of giants. Come on. The shoulder of giants, um, and, and I can't imagine you being on the shoulder of any other giant because you're such a giant. But talk to me about making this. Why was it so important to you? Uh, it was important for for me to make this because people don't understand what we had to go through to get this wonderful NBA that gives everybody this opportunity to to play this great game. Um, it was a battle to get to that point, you know. And back in the 20s and 30s, when the game just started. Uh, it was a totally different uh, landscape, and I wanted to talk about that. And it's also an homage to, to my neighborhood. I, I'm, I'm from Harlem, and the Harlem Wrens basketball team uh, epitomized what the Harlem Renaissance was all about. So you start this process, um, and it's a journey for you putting the whole thing together. Were there any surprises along the way, or did you probably have a, a good sense of what you wanted to create uh, even before you started? Um, there were certainly some surprises, all the stuff that I found out about Coach Wooden, you know, because he played against the Wrens, and, um, you know, I played for him for four years, had no idea that uh, he had that connection, and we, we actually were connected through the Harlem Renaissance, and I had, had no idea about that. It was, it was really fascinating to find that out. What kind of a guy was he, and how much of an uh, imprint did he leave on you and the, and the kids who played for him, do you think? Coach, Coach Wooden saw his ability to get control over the lives of young men as an opportunity for him to uh, fulfill what he wanted to be as a Christian, um, to, to teach us good values and have us learn how to be uh, good parents and good citizens. Uh, that's what he was all about. He wanted us to get our degrees and go out in the world and, and, and do good things. How, how important was education to you in school? Because, you know, I, I think all too often these players see the dollar bill signs, and it's floating out in front of them. A lot of them want to leave college before they get the degree because it, it's, the money's there. Um, how important was education for you? Education was very important for me. I'm the first person in my family to get a degree, and um, I was going to stay in college uh, until I got my degree. That, that was something that I wanted to do just... Uh, because it was uh, uh, an important goal. And education still is important. Uh, you were named an ambassador for STEM. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, those are the key subjects uh, that young people have to understand in order to get good jobs in the 21st century. 
Camp Skyhook has activities kids love, but our goal is to initiate and encourage their interest in STEM. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So I'm working with the uh, LA United School District to emphasize STEM education and give uh, young people a chance while they're still in grade school to understand that if they want to have a great job and uh, do interesting things uh, when they get out of high school, they need to pursue these subjects and um, it will absolutely help our country. Uh, there's a shortfall for engineers. We need all kinds of engineers. A great place to create and uh, harvest those engineers is from the inner cities. Got a lot of smart kids there that don't understand uh, that these opportunities mean uh, great employment and great opportunities for them for the rest of their lives. What about giving back? I mean, you talk about these because I can see your face light up when you talk about that. Obviously, it's exciting to have a sky hook and to win a game, but but I imagine there's there's a you know there's the, I always say there's the payment that goes in your wallet, there's the payment that goes in your heart, and I know that 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 has to be a big part of who you are. Talk to me about giving back and how important that is as, as a feature of your life. Well, what you're talking about giving back is very important to me. I was uh, involved in a mentoring program summer of 1964 in Harlem, and it changed my life. It gave me an idea of uh, what my community was all about, and it gave me ideas about what I could do to change it, to make it better, and uh, how I could fulfill what I wanted to do with my life. I had no idea about that. So um, that program, it was called Har You Act, Harlem Youth Unlimited. And it just en enabled me to, uh, to see some things that were really crucial for me at that time. So I'm sure uh, when you were going through that program, the light bulb went on, the eyes lit up. Oh, yeah. Do you see that in the kids now when you talk to them? I hope so. You know, and we were so lucky. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King came and addressed us that summer, wow. summer of uh, you know, um, 1964. He had just been named uh, Man of the Year. Uh, it was uh, very, very inspirational to have him come tell us that uh, to go on and do what you see needs to be done. You know, to, to get that encouragement from someone like him was uh, was an awesome uh, moment in our lives. What was it like to have his presence there? I mean, was he as awe-inspiring now in history? I mean, the, the legacy of this man. But I mean, to be a young man in, in the presence of Martin Luther King Jr., that must have been phenomenal. Yeah, it, it was amazing. And um, the, the uh, press corps was following him everywhere. And for me, I was in, a, in our journalism workshop, so they gave me press credentials and just put me in with the press corps, and I covered it just like I was a reporter, which is actually what I was supposed to be trying to do, you know. But it was, I got to ask him a question. I mean, I, I, I'll never forget it, you know. It's, it's but, but that, I, that meaningful. But you were kind of an introverted, kind of shy kid. It must have taken a lot of courage for you to, to ask him that question. No, it didn't actually. I, you know, because I, I felt like I was speaking for uh, the youth in my community. Yeah. You know? So it uh, it made me feel uh, I felt empowered at that moment. You know, to ask a question and um, be taken seriously by someone who was doing such wonderful things. Do you remember what you asked? Uh, I asked him what he thought about the program, if he thought it was successful, and he said uh, the program absolutely was successful already because we were already thinking about how to make Harlem a better place. To watch the arc, to to be in a room as a kid with Martin Luther King Jr., and then to be walking around here in the United States and knowing that Barack Obama's president of the United States, to go from that moment to this moment, what's it been like to live that kind of life and see that? It's It's been an, an incredible thing to see uh, the fruits of the Civil Rights Movement, you know, one of the fruits of it that uh, black Americans now participate in our democracy in really meaningful ways. And that's not going to change. Even though there's still a whole lot of resistance, uh, that's not going to change. I, I think uh, that's an incredible thing. When, um, you know, I, I kept my cool in, in 2008, I kept my cool until I saw um, President Obama in, in Lincoln Park there in Chicago. It's been a long time coming. But tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. And, and I thought about my parents, if my parents could have been there for that moment. And th that's when I started crying. I, I saw Jesse Jackson crying. I started crying because 
he understood, you know, what it took for that moment to uh, come to fruition. And, you know, I got it th at that moment just, just watching him. It, it, it was a very emotional time. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, what a delight. Thanks so much for coming in and talking. Certainly appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. An ambitious architectural undertaking has become a cultural connection between two global superpowers. We'll take you to the center of it all next. According to Chinese custom, it's not unusual for families to name their houses. Ying Yu Tong, or Hall of Plentiful Shelter, was the home of a merchant family in southwestern China, providing shelter for many generations of the Huang family for more than 200 years. Today, the house serves a very different purpose as a historical artifact that is educating museum goers about Chinese history and culture, more than 7,000 miles from the site where the home was first built. This is a house built by a merchant family, um, which had a lot of resources. You think about how many dialects the Chinese people speak. You get a sense also the diversity and richness of vernacular architecture and art and the culture in China. And I think that immediately you can pin down, you know, the family members and, and how were they living, how were they traveling, and things they have used, they've touched, and they have made. And I think that really give the average American visitors a sense of how people were living. Yingyu Town was built uh, around the year of uh, 1800 in a place called uh, Huang Village. It's a remote and small village uh, in a place called Huizhou, which is located in the mid-south part of China, about 200 miles from Shanghai. The In Yu Town project helped to raise uh, awareness for historic preservation in that area. In actually means sheltering, and Yu means abundance. As the name of the house signifies, uh, it's a place that provides abundance and sheltering to the family. In fact, about eight generations of the Huang family lived here. When you enter uh, Yin Yu Town, the first room you will encounter is this reception hall here. Um, very important feature of the culture there is uh, respect for the seniors. This reception hall here is actually a place where people can pay homage to their ancestors. It's a very communal area for the family members. Uh, at some point this house contained over 20 people under the same roof here. One of the distinct culture of the Huizhou area is it's known for producing great merchants. Teenager boys, they would be sent away to be apprentice in shops such as pawn shops or be engaged in salt uh, business. 
So they will be sent away to bigger cities to pursue business opportunities. Uh, so in a way that um, this house were, was occupied primarily by women, wives, and young children. And men would come back maybe once half a year, or in better cases, maybe once every few years, and some of them never returned. <laughs> So you can imagine that um, women would be in charge of housework here. They would uh, be taking care of uh, young children as well as seniors. We date this room to 1927 when a young couple was married and this was their sweet uh, wedding room. And you will see a variety of features that convey the meaning of fertility. And a curious feature in the bed is a circular jar which could be filled in hot water. And then you can hug it and it will keep you warm all night. And also, of course, we have uh, features such as this bamboo little cradle for a small kid. Right now, I'm standing in front of uh, one of the most beautiful elements in this gorgeous house. Uh, it's a carved wooden window panel with uh, five pieces. And each of this piece uh, is made of carved uh, camphor wood. So you see dragons, you see uh, linger fungus, which conveys the meaning of immortality and longevity, as well as good wishes. Of course, it serves as a aesthetic or decorative elements of the house, but also it allows air circulation. The house was um, dismantled and created and shipped here uh, in the year 1997. And then it was um, placed in a warehouse. Um, so it allowed us actually to study and document as well as trying to put all the pieces together to, to see whether uh, each piece fits. <laughs> Uh, and the process of documentation, the process of preservation, took us about three years. And then in 2003, the house was uh, re-erected here in the museum in Salem and open to the public. The process was very ambitious and complex, and it required the collaboration of a team of experts from China as well as from the United States. I think the uh, Chinese government are paying more attention to uh, buildings like this, and also the local government has been investing very heavily uh, in historical preservation and in fact recently uh, over 6,000 historical houses like this has been registered as um, cultural heritage sites. The house uh, is amazing time capture is because it contains amazing a range of objects that can tell stories about the changing time in China and also sort of the, the fortune, the rising and falling fortune of the family. We're very, very fortunate to have this great opportunity to present Chinese vernacular architecture and culture, and also use this as a platform for US-China cultural exchange. For example, musicians like Yo Yo Ma has performed here, and uh, the Huang family members had visited here, 
several times. So there are great connections and it's truly an amazing international collaborative effort. That's it for this week. Join the conversation with us on social media. We are CCTV America on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. All of tonight's interviews can be found online at cctv-america.com. And let us know what you'd like us to take full frame next. Email us at fullframe at cctv-america.com. Until then, I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. We'll see you next time.